Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar on understanding the landscape of global family philanthropy. My name is Brian Kastner, and I'm the Global Philanthropy Manager at the Council on Foundation. If you aren't familiar with the Council, we exist to help philanthropy be a strong and trusted partner in advancing the common good. Building on our 70-year history, we are charting a course for the field where funders display high integrity, earn and maintain the public's trust, and serve as excellent stewards of philanthropic resources. We imagine a world where givers of all kinds are sophisticated and vital players in creating more equitable communities and a better world. So our agenda today is to dive into some of the key takeaways from this paper. I'll first speak briefly about the paper and then hand it over to my co-authors to dive a bit deeper into some considerations family should, families should have in mind for conducting global family philanthropy and how they can be successful in doing so. We'll plan to leave about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for a Q&A period. So please feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation and we'll try to get to them at the end of the presentation. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide some key takeaways from a recent paper published by the Council on Foundation in partnership with BNY Mellon Wealth Management and Give to Asia. We wrote this paper to address what we saw as some gaps in the literature about the challenges that, the philanthropic, that philanthropic families face when conducting philanthropy across borders. This, the paper features insights into specific countries and discusses regulatory environments and tax structures that philanthropic families need to be aware of. To help me dive into some of these topics, I'm pleased to be joined today by my co-authors, Joan Crane and Berger stanford -Ohl. Joan Crane is a Senior Director and Global Family Wealth Strategist at BNY Mellon Wealth Management. As a Global Family Wealth Strategist, Joan works closely with wealthy families and their advisors to provide comprehensive and customized wealth planning, business succession, and family governance. Joan joined the firm in 2001 and has more than 25 years of experience working with individuals and families, with a special focus on legal, tax, and personal challenges when navigating through major life transitions. Joan is frequently invited to speak to clients and professional groups such as the American Bar Association, the Hong Kong American Chamber of Commerce, and numerous estate planning councils throughout the United States, Canada, the Middle East, and Asia. An author of many white papers on multinational planning, she was one of the original contributors to the GCC Governance Code of the Family Business Golf and was recently interviewed live on CNBC Asia. Berger Stamperdahl joined Give to Asia in 2006 and has served as its president and CEO since 2014. As one of the leading advocates for localized philanthropy across borders, he works directly with donors, foundations, and corporations seeking to build strategic charitable partnerships in Asia. Prior to joining Gift to Asia, Berger had a successful PR career in Silicon Valley. As the vice president at Porter Novelli, a global marketing and communications firm, he advised clients such as HP, EMC, McAfee, and BMC. Berger holds degrees in journalism and political science from the University of New Hampshire. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, Berger, for being here today. We're first going to talk about some considerations you should have in mind when conducting global family philanthropy. Among some motivations, tax benefits can be one reason why people want to give, but they can often vary drastically across borders. I'm now going to hand it off to Berger to talk more about tax benefits in more depth. I do not provide a strong tax incentive for charitable giving. Um, and even, even, even when there is an incentive that exists for giving domestically, it's quite uncommon for countries to offer a charitable benefit when those funds are, are going overseas. So for example, in, in Singapore, uh, a tax benefit for charitable giving domestically is, is impressively high. It's uh, a 250% uh, tax break based on the size of the gift. Um, but that same gift, if it's intended for an overseas cause from Singapore, um, that tax benefit doesn't exist. But that, that doesn't mean that philanthropy in Singapore stays necessarily in Singapore. We, we certainly have uh, a lot of connections with families that have assets in Singapore that choose to give those assets overseas because they have a, a, a strong affinity to an urgent cause in the region. Generally, health and education are the two biggest causes that we see. Um, but so in, in those cases, they're, they're, they're foregoing the tax benefit that they might get from giving within Singapore um, because they strongly believe in the cause that they're supporting you know, elsewhere. Um, uh, social status is a motivator for charitable giving. Uh, we see that in the United States with large gifts, also 
being associated with buildings being named after them and 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 that sort of thing and that's certainly uh, can be a motivator for for family philanthropy but i think especially as we're looking at at cross border uh, giving by families here uh, personal fulfillment and defining a set of values for the family or for family members is an important and and a, and a rewarding part of why families engage in philanthropy you know across multiple members and as as a family group um, just as an example you know we have one family that we've worked with for for over a dozen years um, and the, the husband and wife have slowly been bringing in their their daughter uh, into the charitable giving and recently handed over the uh, advising responsibility on their donor advice fund at give to asia to that daughter so that she's now much more engaged in what is a, a multi-generational family uh, philanthropic effort across multiple countries. All right, so I want to talk a little bit more about uh, location considerations for families that have, you know, a, a presence in multiple countries. So um, uh, it is important to sort of to look at the, the location from which cross-border families, you know, give from. Um, as noted earlier, the tax incentives um, may not always be a primary reason for giving. Um, however, it makes sense to pay attention to where charitable funds are based in order to maximize, maximize uh, tax benefits. And ultimately, uh, that can increase the amount uh, that a family has available to give if they take those, those considerations into account. Um, the, I, I'll give you a few, some examples of countries and, and the different types of incentives that they provide for cross-border giving specifically. Um, in the United States, uh, it's actually the opportunity to receive a tax benefit for causes overseas is quite good. Um, the U.S. government does have in place certain tests to ensure that funds are used for charitable purpose. Um, and if those tests are met, um, gifts going overseas from a private foundation or from a community foundation or donor advised fund can provide a family with uh, the same tax benefits as a gift that's, that's give, being given domestically. In Canada, the requirements are a little different. Um, a family can deduct 15 to 29% of a gift, um, um, but there are some requirements of how that gift is given and the kinds of engagement donors have or Canada-based charities have with a charitable project. And, and that means that a, a family needs to give to a Canada-based charity, and then typically that Canada-based charity has a contractual relationship with uh, and a partnership as a program manager for a, a, an overseas nonprofit. Um, and payments going towards that project need to be made in installments. So it's a, it's a different model in Canada. Um, in Hong Kong, individual donors can deduct up to 35% of their annual income, um, depending on the level of their charitable giving. Um, and Hong Kong allows for charitable gifts overseas to be tax deductible as long as they fit into some very specific themes for overseas giving that have been defined by the Hong Kong government, uh, such as education or poverty alleviation. Um, so that's actually quite open and probably the most open uh, for charitable giving overseas that exists within the area where we work, which is Asia. Um, but given these differences that exist country by country, um, it can also have an impact then on timing of gifts and where people give from, where families give from at different times to maximize the incentives. Um, and, um, and, and I think that the, the where families give from um, can probably be, um, you know, can probably be from anywhere in the world, but, it's, but, it, but it does sometimes require a charitable partner um such as a donor advised fund or a community foundation that can take on the responsibility of managing the the cross-border philanthropy um and the the sort of the compliance issues or regulatory issues that families might need to be thinking about as they're thinking about where their assets are based and how those assets might move charitably overseas all right so the uh the next slide i just want to go into a little bit more on regulatory concerns that uh, families might have, and I, I think this primarily focuses a bit more on the U.S. because I believe that is the primary interest of today's audience. Um, um, and one of the questions we often get is, 
can 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 we do this <laughs> and with something very specific in mind and questions about making sure that it's done properly both from the perspective of giving from the united states but also from the recipient country and on the u.s side preserving the tax deductibility of a gift is off, often the most prime you know primary concern um, and in the u.s an individual can't simply write a check to an overseas nonprofit from their personal bank account um, and expect to get a tax benefit families um, need to either give to a into a private foundation in the United States or to a, another charitable partner uh, like a donor advised fund. And then that private foundation or the donor advised fund typically follows guidelines to protect the donor's tax deduction. And part of that can be simply ensuring that the project being funded is charitable. Um, the IRS has clear definitions and a list of what is considered charitable activity by an overseas uh, entity. Um, so for example, you know, project must uh, based funding has to meet a, a, a public benefit test, uh, meaning that the group benefiting from the project must uh, can't be too narrow. It needs to benefit benefit the, the overall target community. Um, and so I'm also happy to answer more questions, you know, during the QA about expenditure responsibility and equivalency determination. Uh, those are topics that we, we talk about quite often. Um, but basically there, there are two procedures that rec are recommended by the US Treasury, Treasury to manage overseas grants. And one follows the money through to completion, basically following the money through a specific project uh, with reporting and due diligence requirements. Um, the other is a legal determination that the overseas uh, grant recipient is the equivalent of what is considered a charitable organization in the United States. Um, and so the there's a due diligence also that's required to protect against um, uh, you know any kind of, of money laundering. There are clearly US regulations and regulations in other countries around uh, that kind of due diligence, which we can talk a, a little bit more about in the uh, Q&A as well. Um, but on the recipient country side, there are also regulations for families to think about if they're giving to uh, specific countries that may um, you know, regulate charitable funds coming in. For, for us, the two uh, most active countries receiving funds in the work that we do are uh, China and India. Um, both of them have, have regulations around charitable funds coming into their country. On, on the China side, there are um, approvals that need to be made on a, on a per grant basis. Um, and in, in some cases, uh, such as we give to Asia, there's a, a requirement for a, a registration in, 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 in China for uh, following uh, sort of an activity plan on an annual basis with very clearly listed projects that are defined ahead of time. In India, there are regulations specifically on the local nonprofits that are receiving funds from overseas donors and one of the big ones there is uh, the foreign contributions registration act which is fcra that all uh, charities in india have to have um, in order to receive overseas funds so those are those are a couple of the considerations that families might need to think about as they're as they're granting into a country that may have regulations on how those charitable funds need to be handled And then just finally, I'm going to um, uh, just touch on a, in a case study uh, for uh, uh, a family we work with. Um, Gift Asia has many families based in, in multiple locations that have connections uh, specifically into India. Um, and I just wanted to share this, this one example of a, of a family that has a, has a presence in three different countries and in India and the United States and the UK, um, and they've set up their their own sort of charitable um, uh, entities or accounts in those in those countries. In India, they've chosen to set up a charitable trust. Um, in both the United States and in the UK, um, they have you know ba basically donor advised funds, um, and they have family members in all three countries that are engaged in shared philanthropic activities and the activities that we have a view into um, are activities in India. Um, but, but that family has to take into account uh, 
um, a few different things. They need to take into account the tax benefits and where assets are located in those three countries. Um, perhaps, um, you know, most importantly for this family in India, um, they have more flexibility with the funds that they have in India that are sourced in India for charitable purpose because the regulations around those funds and how they're dispersed um, doesn't have to deal with the FCRA issue that I just mentioned, which, um, which, which their funds coming from their charitable accounts overseas um, need, need, to, uh, need to consider and they need to only fund organizations that have FCRA registration in India. Um, but in general, that family is, um, is in regular contact uh, across family members around specific projects that they've cho chosen and uh, to engage in and very specific communities that they've chosen to engage in in, in India. And um, they've, um, they've, they've certainly made a big impact um, by sort of leveraging those assets in different ways. Um, I think that in, as we move on to the next speaker, uh, Joan's gonna talk a bit more about the the considerations and planning that happens at the family level around um, bringing the, the families that with uh, presence in multiple countries together for planning purposes and sort of strategizing on exactly the decisions that they make as they as they think about their philanthropy. So I'm going to hand uh, this over now to Joan to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, thank you, Berger, and uh, thank you, Brian, too, for your intro. Um, oops, I just tapped it to advance the slide, and I lost the webinar. <laughs> I don't know about this. Um, let's see. Okay, it did advance the slide. Okay, good. As if we haven't heard enough on the technical side about taxes and uh, restrictions, I've got more. <laughs> and that's how do these families actually pick a structure? Berger just mentioned there's, there was an Indian trust and there were donor advised funds for that one family. You know, what are all the options and, and how does a family ever decide? Well, first of all, I'd like to, to point out my first bullet here um, on this slide, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, a famous quote from Peter Drucker, the management consultant guru, but it has a, a very important message here. It's look at the family first. Don't think of, well, this wonderful structure, I've heard about it, I love the idea of a family foundation, which, of course, people in the US and Canada are enamored with, they get the name on it, blah, blah. But, you know, is that really what the family's uh, all about? Are they gonna be able to manage it? Where is that gonna be located? What are the ages of, and the goals, et cetera, et cetera. So what might look wonderful on paper, because we, we advisors with our MBAs, et cetera, can sketch it out. Um, you know, really, really think through on how that's going to work for the family, parents right now, kids, and eventually grandkids. And of course, make it as flexible as possible because times will change. So the primary distinctions when, when choosing the structure, how formal does the family want it to be? And I'll show you on the next slide the whole continuum from a very informal, but that can also be very successful format for a family versus something that's quite tied up and, and quite formally um, set up. And related to that is how hands-on do the family members want to be, or at least some of the family members, um, versus, uh, you know, do, is it do-it-yourself grant or is it grants where somebody else actually takes care of a lot of the vetting and, and the things that Berger was talking about. And there's usually no one perfect structure. So again, it's a trade-off between priorities and taxes how much privacy, what local expertise, wherever you're gonna base it, and just general personal preferences. So we'll see if I can advance this slide better. No, that didn't work. Okay, good. Um, in choosing the structure, I mentioned that it goes from one end of the other end to the other end of the continuum. We'll start here on the left with checkbook giving, which is what it sounds like. You write a check to a charity, by the way, we're on these last two on the left side, checkbook giving and charities with overseas programs. We're thinking of US-based, the gifts coming from a US-based account or a US-based charity. And so obviously with, with checkbook giving, it would really be from a client's own checkbook 
writing a check to to a charity wherever it might be. As Burma mentioned, in the U.S., that's not going to get any sort of tax deduction, but it certainly doesn't mean it isn't done. And in fact, let's expand the idea of checkbook now to since everything's going online. And for the millennials, it wouldn't be checkbook, but it would be uh, one of the online, like Kiva.org or some other online way of giving where you can pick um, recipients all over the world. It could also be crowdfunding type for a charitable cause. And again, that can be really attractive, especially to young people, and it can get a lot of ground, you know, from the ground level up um, giving. But as, as people mature in their gifting and, but, and as they get wealthier and in the U.S., if they want a tax deduction, sometimes that isn't uh, their preference anymore. So it's starting with the simple things on the left, giving to a U.S. charity with an overseas program, that will probably get a, tax, a U.S. tax deduction. Going into the, the second center there with direct giving, we're talking here again about a direct gift to a foreign-based charity. So it's not direct to the recipient, like writing a check um, to somebody you see online, but it's more giving to that, that charity in India or, or China or wherever else in the world. <clears throat> and there's challenges there, you know, vetting that charity. There's been a lot of bad press in the United States, in China, even over the Red Cross. How do you really know that they're they're doing it well? And of course, then again, you've got for U.S. Uh, people that are looking for tax deduction, you've got a bit of a challenge on that. Um, <clears throat> you probably wouldn't get the tax deduction. Now we go over to the giving circles, donor advised funds, and family foundations. Those are all ways of, of joint giving for the family. Those are where family members in one or more countries are probably going to collaborate, um, either under one umbrella structure or at least in their discussions about who they're going to give to. So the giving circle, um, some of you may be familiar with those old investment clubs. Uh, it's the same idea. It's a group of people, in this case, we're talking about family members, just getting together, talking about what causes matter to them and where they would like to give, and then making one or, or more gifts to a particular charity. And it, it could be overseas or it could be uh, local. In this case, we're usually talking about giving something to uh, some charity based elsewhere or a U.S. charity with a foreign, um, a foreign program. Donor advised funds, which Berger has mentioned a lot, take that up a notch. Um, most people know about these now. They're available uh, in Canada, the U.K., the U.S. Uh, other countries like Singapore and Hong Kong are getting them started. Very, very popular. Basically, they're separate accounts sponsored and administered by a public charity. So think Gift to Asia, think your local community foundation, and even now think Vanguard and, and Fidelity and BNY Mellon. Um, financial institutions um, have these as well. There's quite a bit of difference in the support you might get from one organization to another. So again, that depends on what the family's looking for with their donor advised fund. But it, it can be very handy for a family, and somebody could set it up in, for instance, the U.S., and the U.S. people who give to it could get a nice tax deduction, and maybe the other donors from the other family members, like in a couple of families I have, the other family members live in Hong Kong. Well, their tax rate is very low there. They're not really concerned about whether they would get a tax deduction, and actually, as Berger said, Hong Kong is one of the most liberal anyway, but that's not their, their main focus, so the U.S. base uh, works well for them. Then on the far right, we have family foundations. Um, these can have different names in different countries. There's the Stiftung in Liechtenstein and some of the other European uh, countries. Basically, it's a family's private entity, a private little business. And I tell families, really think carefully before you do this because it is like running a little business. And um, I have a sad story about a, a family, U.S.-based, looking to set up a private foundation to give everywhere in the world, but that wasn't the, the issue. That wasn't the problem with them. They really just, although they seemed very charitable and they had done a donor advised fund, when it came to actually managing that family foundation, filling in the forms even to set it up, doing uh, negotiating or talking to the, the accountant and the legal advisor, they, nobody wanted to take charge. There was a lack of a champion within the family and actually after a year, we ended up closing it down and transferring all the funds into their donor advised funds. 
So again, caution before people run into these wonderful sounding entities that maybe you have your name on, but um, you have to spend time on. So I don't know how much anybody on the phone ever works in the Middle East, but they have a Sharia compliant structure called a WAC, which is an endowed charitable entity. And it could actually be under the umbrella of, of a foundation or a trust in the US. But as long as it's Sharia compliant, it, that's good for them because that's what they want, with the, not so much the tax issue, but just the Sharia principles. So moving on then to the next slide, um, choosing the structure, again, the caveats when you're getting across the border. Um, as Berger mentioned, the restrictions on gifts by individual donors to foreign charities. Um, so U.S. donors have to look for ways to work around this. Um, a good example, again, the U.S. charity that has uh, branches abroad or the foreign charity that has one of those friends of organizations. If you're an alumni like I am from a, a college or university outside the United States, you've probably had pleas for, for gifts from something called Friends of and the name of your college. Um, those are, are fine. They have to be set up so that they comply with the U.S. regulations to be um, a public charity. And the gifts that are given into them have to be restricted in a certain way, but um, they work very well. And the educational institutions are known for having them. Uh, Singapore is very generous with their tax deductions to in-country gifts, as uh, Berger has already spoken about, but not at all generous about anything that goes outside the country. And even the countries that aren't so restrictive, um, they could have requirements. And we've mentioned Hong Kong a couple of times, specifically gifts from Hong Kong to get a tax deduction off their <laughs> relatively small tax rate, but it, you know, still there's a deduction there. They have to go, whether they're in country or, or across the border, they have to be to alleviate po poverty um, for education, for medical or for religion, re religious region, reasons. And that's pretty consistent, again, with what Greater China is um, thinking of when they're restricting their, their charitable gifts. Um, there's heightened requirements, again, for gifts from private foundations versus giving it to a community foundation to give to Asia or, or some other public foundation. I list here the public foundations, they're under the 501c3 in the, the US. With them, the due diligence burden of foreign gifts is on the, the uh, public foundation. They need to go through whatever due diligence, not necessarily the equivalency determination, um, as Berger mentioned, but they have to ensure that whatever they're doing is used for a tax exempt purpose that's, con uh, that's consistent with their own mission, and they have to have some best practices, preferably in writing, um, review by the board, a grant agreement, looking over periodic accountings, there's all sorts of lists of best practices. So I know the larger foundations like our community foundation here in, in Fort Lauderdale, they will do gifts outside the country, but um, they have to be fairly substantial because they do need to go through some extra work there. Private foundations are governed by what Berger always already mentioned, um, the specific IRS regulations and they really require having outside counsel and tax experts um, do that due diligence. So the difference, again, the private foundation, the due diligence burden and, and expense is going to be on the family and the private foundation. In the, in the public arena, it's going to be on, on that um, public foundation themselves. So we come to this whole thing, again, I mentioned before, the, the kind of tug of war between donor advice fund or family foundation. So um, Berger and I just made a little list here of some of the, the considerations to run through. Um, does, does the donor get a tax deduction and how big? Remember, a donor advised fund is under the umbrella of a public charity. So in the US, there's a greater percentage of, of somebody's income that can be deducted each year um, for that versus a private foundation. Big one here is that a, a family foundation, a private foundation, has a minimum required annual payout in the U.S., 5%, whereas a public uh, charity and a donor advised fund under that umbrella has none. Now, we don't encourage, uh, I'm sure GiftAsia doesn't, and our community foundation doesn't, and most of them 
most of the public um, foundations with donor advice funds do not encourage people to just stockpile money and never give it away. So <clears throat> against public policy, you know, it would be for rich people to just pump, put money there and not make grants. And actually, in, there are studies have shown that there are more grants um, made out of that than even the 5%. So it's not like people are stockpiling. But the beauty of that is if we, if, for instance, I have clients who towards the end of the year, they might have had a, a big tax event and they've got a lot of uh, tax, taxable income suddenly. They know they want to give to charity, but they don't know which ones, and it might take them a couple of years to figure that out. So by putting it in a donor advised fund, they can take their time and not be rushed um, because of worrying about 5% this year, 5% the next year, et cetera. The expense to maintain, again, um, family foundation, private foundation can be a lot more expensive. We usually tell people, you should think of having at least five million in it, if not at the inception, but within some reasonable time after it's set up, just to justify all the different legal and tax filings. How simple it is, is, is who's, how much control. The control is an issue that people push people a little towards their own private foundation, because of course you can staff it with your own family members. Um, there is more control, there's no doubt about it. Um, how much the family wants to be involved in then your, your family legacy. So again, is there's no one that suits uh, that's better or the uh, other. It just depends on what the family is all about, and these are these are some of the things to think about. I have a nice case study here, an example of a family I worked with, um, the Williams. Well, we use the name Williams; it wasn't actually them, but they're a large multi generational family. Had three generations that I was working with. Family members were primarily at the beginning. They were when it was two generations. They were in the U.S. and U.K. Um, they had established the what they call the Williams Family Foundation in the United States. Um, the required payout, the 5%, was allocated amongst the adult family members. And so at one point, there were four family adult family members. They each took a quarter of the 5%, and they just picked, you know, where are we going to give the money? It had to, since they wanted the, it to be tax compliant for the deductions for those in the U.S. It, and it was a private foundation in the U.S., they had to satisfy uh, the U.S. tax rules. As the family grew, though, and there, some people were moved to the U.K., seemed to be staying there permanently, they and the younger members, they said, you know, we'd like a little more impact on this. It's supposed to be a family foundation. It seems like it's just being run by a few people, very U.S.-centric. So we did some, some meetings with them. We agreed on a common mission and started focusing the don donations on a couple of areas. Um, specifically, actually, with this family, it was children, and it was uh, ed ch early childhood education and helping poorer children as they got into middle school, et cetera. Um, the family members in the UK, though, eventually they said, well, this is all fine, and we love doing this for you in the US, but you know what? We really want to give to a UK charity because we want to get our deduction as well. And um, so there is a way that and I definitely would need to get good cross-border counsel on this but that a, a family foundation based in the U.S. can open up a subsidiary charitable foundation in certain other countries, the U.K. being one of them, and have, the, have it compliant with both the U.K. and the U.S. tax rules, and therefore get it, gifts out of it would be, um, would get tax deductions for the donors in the respective countries. So it's one umbrella organization with two, two little branches and able to give cross-border and get the proper tax deductions. So we did that, it's, it's operating very well, and on the family governance side, it's become a great tool for uh, bringing along the younger generation, which I'll actually talk about in, on the next slide. Um, as Brooke mentioned, I, I uh, specialize not only in philanthropy, but also in um, what we call, for lack of a better term, family governance. But helping families transfer their wealth from one generation to another by learning how to work together on these joint projects and joint entities. And one of the key things here is having regular family meetings um, and very, very important. Before they start saying, oh, I want to give to this charity and why don't we, I love this one, you know, and let's have Mrs. X come in and talk to us about her wonderful uh, arts facility or whatever. We get, get the family together and we have a couple of little exercises that explore what are the family values. 
And some families will, the parents will say to me, you know, my family members are all really different. There's no common values. Well, we go through the exercise and every family that I've done this with has a couple or usually three uh, core values that they all kind of agree on. These, these would be great causes. These are things that matter to us. For out of that flows a family vision or maybe a philanthropic mission statement. Then they start giving, not by having some elaborate stru structure yet, by the informal, maybe direct giving in the U.S., if there's some cross-border connections, maybe giving to the local charities in the other country. It evolves, as we saw in that continuum, to a more formal structure, whatever makes sense. Maybe professional advisor helping on that, making joint grants in various locations, and finally, ending up with a, a, a structure that's usually less formal and um, like a donor advised fund or a family foundation. But again, I, I can't stress too much that every family is different. It's a process, um, it's dynamic, and it can actually evolve with different generations over time. But the beauty of it is it gets younger, younger members of the family involved in the philanthropy. Maybe they don't make the final decision at the beginning, but they get to sit on a, an advisory board for grants, on a committee to recommend the investments if it's a, a private foundation um, or whatever. And so related to that, I'll, I'll wind up my section here with a, just one more uh, case study of, of a, another family who were all really, really successful entrepreneurs. They had this global hotel chain. Uh, it had diversified. They owned other industries. Um, there were four generations involved when we were working with them. And the second generation were currently in charge, but they were the, the old aging baby boomers. And um, they realized, you know, it's time to get some of the next people, upcoming our kids involved, whoever's maybe capable and interested. So we did the family meeting. We went through some values and communications exercises. Um, I, I was observing that it didn't seem like there was any core family value in here other than make money and expand our business. But I was wrong. Uh, we did the family values ex exercises. And uh, again, they, they focused in very heavily on the whole medical field, medical research. Um, I think a couple of family members had benefited from some um, early research in different diseases. And therefore, the, the philanthropic mission statement that they really were able to narrow down quite closely was, was related to hospitals and, um, and especially research type grants for medical things. So in the third family meeting, um, we got into, well, what kind of gifts, how do we structure this? And we did, we went on and actually formed the Family Foundation. And they called it the Family Foundation for Entrepreneurs because that was where the money had come from. But uh, now as it proceeds into maybe the actually third generation being quite involved, it's, um, it's actually more, really more of a, a medical support, medical research type foundation. And there's certain family members that are of, of the third generation that are taking leadership and that are really enthusiastic and passionate. So in this case, I fully agree with their setting up the, their own private foundation. They seem to have the number of fam the volume in the family members and in the wealth um, that can sustain that. Um, and it's important to, to note that in any family, you're not the parents are uh, not realistic if you're thinking that all of your children and all of your grandchildren are going to love this, this philanthropic mission. For some people, it's just not what they focus on. Um, but others may surprise you, as in this family, because I, I, I just watched how they were so great with their business. And I couldn't see them as philanthropists, but I was uh, definitely missing a lot on that. So um, with that, as we wind up and we want to leave time for questions, I just had um, you know, a final last minute thing about the whole idea of, of global family philanthropy. It's really exciting, if you haven't sensed that already, from Brian and Berger and I. Um, there's lots of new vehicles developing here. I haven't mentioned some of these innovative things in the U.S., like the Charitable Limited um, Partnership, Limited LLC, um, new donor advised fund structures throughout the world, new laws, the China New Charity Act, new ways of even investing the funds, which we do get into in our paper, but we didn't have time for this um, at this webinar. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Brian. We can open it up for questions. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, Berger. We do have some questions that have come in, but I also wanted to flag um, on the sl current slide, you can see the link as to where to download this report. And in our follow-up from this webinar, we'll also be sending around the report 
Um, so uh, we we have a couple questions. The first one is, please give us a, a real example of a locally registered charity with global overseas programs. Uh, Berger, Joan, do either of you want to provide some examples? This is a global uh, literacy. So oh, sorry. Go go ahead, Berger. Yeah, I was going to ask a clarifying question too, which is yeah, so yeah. so it's a. a a, a U.S. registered charity with global with global programs is that I think that's the I, question. Yeah, I believe so. I believe that's what the intention okay. is. Yeah. Um, I know. I, I, yeah, I mean, I actually think that's fairly fairly. Uh, uh, there there are quite a number of them. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, I, I can think of a couple here where I'm based in San Francisco that specifically uh, run uh, programs in south and southeast asia there's a, a there's a uh, a group called read global for example that that runs uh uh literacy programs in india uh nepal and bhutan um but they're us based so they you you can give to them directly for the programs that they're that for for their their subsidiary organizations in uh in, in those countries i think the 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 other side of that the flip the flip side of that is the friends of funds that are supporting locally based organizations or in country organizations in other countries um which is also was mentioned in the presentation which there are quite a number of um uh, that that are maybe they don't have a us presence but they do have a partner in the us uh like a university as joan mentioned uh so there's a lot of examples of, of, of both types Great, thanks, Berger. Yeah, and I do want to clarify when we when we use this terminology, locally registered charity with global programs, we're really talking about like your Save the Children's, your World Visions, those types of organizations that have offices in the U.S. Maybe their headquarters is in the U.S., um, but they also have offices internationally. Um, so we're not talking about like intermediaries that, or community foundations who might have donor advice funds or you know, um, or even friends of organizations. We're really just talking about those big INGOs. Um, so another question that has come up um, is, is it correct that donor advised funds are set up with 501c3 organizations? And if so, what's the difference between DAFs and regular grants given by family foundations? Um, so Joan, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, yeah, the answer to the first part is yes. They're set up, as I mentioned, um, now the, you might say, well, is Fidelity and are the, is Vanguard a, a 501c3? Is BNY Mellon a 501 No, but what we've done, we financial institutions to be able to offer donor advised funds is uh, set up separate uh, companies, related companies um, that are five of, you know, get the 501c3 designation. And I can tell from our experience at BNY Mellon, these companies, must be kept very separate from the for-profit um, sister company. Um, you know, even the investments are done separately, the discussions with the advisors, et cetera. Um, it's a, a complete wall between the two so that they do function like their own uh, little public charity. And then there was a, oh, what was the second part? It was how do they differ from a, what was that part, Brian? How do they, yeah, the question says, what's the difference between um, DAF and regular grants um, given by family foundations? So is there a difference ah. between granting out from a DAF and granting out from a family foundation, I think? Yeah, I mean, usually uh, donors to a DAF think of it all as their quasi-private foundation. I know some of the DAFs um, that I work with will allow people, donors, if they put a certain amount in there to even have their own name on it, they make recommendations as to the investment um, strategy within very tight boundaries, but they still do have some input. And more importantly, they make recommendations as to the grants. And it's pretty rare, um, unless the, their recommended recipient is not qualified to, to receive a charitable grant, it's very rare that the uh, 501c3 parent would, would say no. You know, we're not going to give. Now, it's rare. It has happened. I've heard of a couple where there was very good reason why they didn't do it. But um, again, it's, uh, it's extremely uncommon. So whereas a grant out from a public charity um, is much more under the control and, and 
you know, of, of the charity themselves. I, I, I know some of the charities have other ways that you can donate money to them and designate it for causes. And maybe that might seem similar to the DAF, but the DAF allows a, a, a donor to pick every year or, or whenever they want what causes and, um, and be fairly certain they're going to go in what proportions they want uh, when they want. This is Berger. I, I might it just there, there's one other angle on that question that the, the questioner might be thinking about, and that is uh, compliance issues of grants going out from a private foundation versus uh, donor advised fund if those grants are going overseas. And we talked a little bit about ER and ED and the U.S. Treasury requirements for grants going overseas, and those gr those regulations primarily apply to private foundations. Um, and while I believe the, the regulations technically for donor advised funds and public charities is still not as clearly defined as for private foundations, because there's a lack of clarity there, I think the best practice for just about every donor advised fund organization I know is to treat the donor advised fund like a private foundation in terms of meeting those, those regulations for overseas grant making. Great, thank you, Berger, for that uh, clarification. Uh, so, more questions coming in. Um, let me see. So, to what extent do tax deductions motivate wealthy families to make charitable gifts and to choose a vehicle and cause that permits those deductions? So, really, I think the question is, you know, is there research about how much donors are motivated by tax deductions? I know we mentioned that this is, you know, more common in the U.S. Maybe. Um, than other areas, but any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, I know there's oh. been uh, there's been studies and and statistics and surveys, and um, they come up sometimes with different results depending on the how the question's worded or when it was asked. Like, was there a, a change about to occur in a in the U.S. tax deduction laws? Um, I know there at one point there was a survey that said only 17% of of uh, donations were motivated. I think was primarily by tax, um, but that didn't say only by tax. It said primarily. So maybe you know tax wasn't the primary at that moment in the when the person answered the survey, but it it could have still been a factor. And um, whenever we're about to meddle with the charitable deduction um, and the U.S. tax code, there's usually a groundswell of, of you know people say answering surveys saying that it'll um, do what it, whatever to their giving. Um, but I, I don't have anything that I would rely on as a, a you know, rule of thumb as far as, as how much tax is a, fa a factor. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, there's a question here about friends funds, and is that the same thing as a U.S. fiscal sponsorship? Uh, Berger, do you want to take a stab at that one? Uh, it is. Uh, so the at least I can answer from Give to Asia's perspective and from the perspective of some other organizations that I know that operate Friends of Funds or Fiscal Sponsorship Funds. It's, you know, the way that we think about it anyway um, is uh, a, a fund that has been designated by our board to benefit a specific organization that we vetted in, in Asia. And so uh, donors can then give into that fund and know that those donations are going to go to support that specific organization. Um, and we do have several Asia-based universities that take advantage of that, um, that kind of a fund, um, but certainly other kinds of organizations as well. There are, there are some organizations that treat fiscal sponsorship a little bit differently, where um, they're actually running more of the sort of the back office operations of what is essentially a foundation inside of a foundation. Um, but that's not what Give to Asia um, and some of the other organizations that I know that specifically are working internationally do. So there's a, there's a little bit of a multiple definition there for what fiscal sponsorship is. And the whole, I'd, I'd agree, and I'd even say that the whole term friends funds and friends of funds, I've seen different definitions. Um, you know, they all have kind of the same idea, but they're they're defined slightly differently, um, just de depending on who's talking, because it's not really a, a tax-driven term. Perfect. 
Thank you, Beth. Uh, I believe this is the final question. Um, so if you're just getting started with making grants internationally, how can you possibly begin to understand all the rules and regulations? Uh, and how can you make sure you do it correctly? So I'll, I'll make a plug here for the, the Council on Foundations. Our Global Philanthropy Program has a lot of great resources. If you're a foundation, I recommend you uh, get in touch with me or check it out on the website. Um, but maybe, Berger, do you want to take the first stab at this? And then, Joan, if you have any other thoughts? Sure. And, and this is also going to be a little bit of a plug because I think the answer really is that there are, you know, multiple organizations out there that can help uh, with ensuring that those regulations are met. And certainly donor advised funds that have a regular practice of giving overseas can do that, such as Give to Asia, because Asia is the interest. But there are organizations that do that kind of international grant making, you know, to just about every part of the world. Um, so finding the right partner there that has that expertise. And if you're talking about a private foundation, family foundation that is doing this, not, not, not a donor advised fund, I think those, those kind of partnerships can still exist. Um, uh, you know, I know a lot of, of, of organizations that do international grant making as, as intermediary organizations um that are receiving funds from us-based private foundations uh and then making the grants um but i also agree with what brian just said is that the council on foundation is a great resource for 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 learning and then um you know there's 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 always uh uh legal counsel as well that i think is important for a private foundation that's figuring out its own practices around this yeah, I'll, I'll conclude with a segue from that and a sort of semi-plug, um, not for BMI Mellon, but for the many um, specialized expertise, expert um, CPAs, uh, attorneys, um, philanthropic advisors, but especially the legal and tax um, professionals. And there are some that, that dwell, especially in cross-border, in setting up these types of foundations and um, making sure all the tax compliance is done, et cetera. I, I really think if it's going to be a private foundation, you're doing your own research as a step one, like Council on Foundations and surveying other organizations. I think that's very, very important. I think you're, you really are well advised to also get a little, at least, legal counsel or, um, <clears throat> or an accountant who specializes in that. Great. Thank you, Beth. Uh, and if you're listening in and you submitted a question or you have not submitted a question, but you have a question, feel free to email us uh, and we'll try to respond to them via email. Uh, but I believe that's our time. So thank you once again, Joan and Berger. Uh, and I encourage everyone to go check out the report online. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye, right. everyone.